Good morning. We welcome you to worship this morning. The masked man behind me playing the piano is Tim Schultz, and we thank you, Tim, for your gift of music that you bless us with this morning. The invitation that you just gave us was to remember that the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ our Lord. And there's first with that was, come we that love the Lord. Out in Sanctuary today is Felicity. She is also masked, but she's also presenting to us that uh, gift of live streaming music so that our worship so that we can come together. Once again, Central Lutheran Church of Yakima gathers together, separated, separated to worship as a virtual community as is our church custom, we gather in God's presence in word and words, hymns and praise. Though united in Christ, we are separated from each other. May the Holy Spirit bind us together and empower with unwavering hope that will be Everything will be well for each of us individually, for us as a church family, and for our Yakima Valley. Let us turn heart, mind, and soul to worship in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us worship God. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, 
whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Join me in silent prayer. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance, and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference. And we do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us. And in your spirit, lead us, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Let us receive. Our forgiveness. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let us live now in hope, for hope does not disappoint. But God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Amen. Until they have 
water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and succeed in the thing for which I say. For you shall go out in joy, and be led back in peace. The mountains and the hills before you, they'll burst forth into song, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorns shall come up the cypress, instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle, and it shall be to the Lord for a memorial. For an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. The Psalm of the Morning Collection for today is also a thanksgiving that reminds us exactly what God is doing in the midst of travail within our communities and our lives. The psalmist writes, Praise is to you. O God, in Zion, and to you shall voice or vows be performed. O you who answer prayer, to you all flesh shall come. When deeds of iniquity overwhelm us, you forgive our transgressions. Happy are those whom you choose and bring near to live in courts. We shall not be satisfied with the goodness of your house, your holy temple. By awesome deeds, you answer us with deliverance. O God of our salvation, you are the hope of the earth and the farthest seas. By your strength, you establish the mountains. You are girded with might. You silence the roaring of the seas, the roaring of the waves, the tumult of the peoples. Those who live at God's, live at Earth's farthest, farthest battles, are awed by your signs. You make the gateways of the morning and the evening shout for joy. You visit the earth and you water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide the people with grain, for so you have prepared it. Your water is furrows abundantly, setting its riches, softening it with showers, and blessing its growth. You crown the year with your bounty. Your wagon tracks overflow with richness. The pastures of the wilderness overflow. The hills gird themselves with joy. The meadows close themselves with flocks. The valleys deck themselves with grain. They shout and they sing together for joy. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle reading this morning is found in Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of the sinful flesh, and to deal with sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh, but those 
those who live according to the Spirit. They set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh, they cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the Spirit of Christ. Since the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, through the body, the body is dead because of sin. The Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies, also to the Spirit that dwells in you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gospel act of acclamation will be played by Tim. Namely, what does this mean? 
What does this mean that we are a people that have not solved civil strife? What does it mean that a tiny virus can cripple a world? What does it mean that insurgents join the ranks of protesters, turning righteous anger into chaos? What does it mean that so many people are without work? What does it mean that we place our hopes in political, medical, financial, and technological solutions that can launch people into the space, but are unable to propel us to love each other? What does it mean? It means we cannot save ourselves. It means we are no better than those who crucified Jesus. It means we need you to save us from ourselves. Paul's writing in Romans has sought to answer a lot of these questions. It is a writing that I think is key in many respects. Some people have referred to Acts as the fifth gospel. I would like to see Romans sometimes be understood as another gospel, just not to a particular church at Rome, but a letter that really establishes the fact that what the gospel writers were telling about Jesus is what God was doing for us through Jesus. Paul has reached the conclusion after giving us all of those platitudes about the fact that we walk by faith and we're justified by faith. After giving us the platitudes that indeed all has sinned and come short of the glory of God. After giving us the platitudes that indeed we are separated by God to our sin. And that Moses and Abraham, and even now visited. We're not able to accomplish the task that Jesus Christ was able to accomplish. Paul reaches, I think, the high point of his writings, his gospel, in Romans 7 and 8. He says in chapter 7, in conclusion to the struggles that he personally finds in trying to be obedient to the law, he says this, O wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Christ Jesus our Lord. So then with my mind, I'm a slave to the law of God, but with my flesh, I'm a slave to the law of sin. And then he breaks forth. He finally gets it. And he says, there is therefore now no condemnation. Did you get that? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. God sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and to deal with sin. He condemned sin in the flesh so the just requirement of the law will be filled in us. I love the way that this eighth chapter begins. There are two words that I want to center on this morning. First, the word is condemnation. I believe that condemnation is something that is really rampant within our society today. It wasn't long ago, just a matter of days ago, that a person that I know very well said to me these words, I really believe David that God is in the process of condemning me 
and condemning the society in which I live. I know that my sins are causing God to allow evil to overtake me. There's no hope for me, or even in this world there's no hope. What does this mean, David? I recognize this person was, was stating two things about condemnation that I find a worldview that is private. The first is a performance based conduct condemnation. It says that what I do affects how God treats me. When I do wrong, God punishes me. When I continue to do wrong, God condemns me. And if I don't go to church every Sunday, I will not have an opportunity to get right with God before he condemns my sin and throws sickness or some other tragedy upon me. This performance-based condemnation, I think, is the guilt that many people suffer from today in the midst of the pandemic that we are living in. The second thought, though, is patience-based condemnation. Enlightenment, post-modernity, they suggest that things will get better if we are just patient enough. It's a perception of condemnation that says simply, I must endure, I must put up with, I must suck it up, and I must endure for purpose right now so that things will get better. The point is, is that these two worldviews seem to suggest that we are in the midst of condemnation and there's really nothing that we can do. Neither of these answers align with Hebrew or the Christian understanding of how God works. In the midst of a pandemic, in a world in turmoil, in a world with predominant fear, exploding depression, oppressing hopelessness, God wants us to hear, to understand and keep alive hope. That's what Romans 8 is all about. Do you remember what he said in the very beginning? There is therefore now no condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation. God sets the relationship requirements. He says that I created you and I created you for good. And I created you to live in relationship with me. And from the get-go of creation, we see throughout the Old Testament and in the New Testament that God who has set the boundaries and told us how to live in right relationship with him says, ultimately, I will forgive you. And we see this pattern develop throughout these scriptures. We see this pattern develop throughout the people that we look in the Old Testament and find to be great people that still need to be forgiven. Abraham. <laughs> oh, Pharaoh. This is my sister. It's not my wife. Don't worry about her. And God said, I forgive you. Moses and Andrew broke the talents. God said, I forgive you. King David. King Saul, King Rehoboam, even Jeremiah the prophet. All of them had to experience a God who provides forgiveness. And that's why the importance of Romans 8 is so important for us today. Because we have a rescuing God. 
A God who says in the midst of all of this, I know that you're not able to accomplish the task of living without sin. So I want to make that possible. And the rescuing God that says, Ah, I'll send my son, my only son, Jesus, who became the Christ, the Messiah. He's the one that can go to the cross and pay the penalty for sin. He's the one that will rescue my children. But that's the stop there, according to Romans 8. We also have a calling of God. We are people who understand that it is the Spirit that beckons us. Over and over, Romans challenges us to live in the Spirit of Christ, to relate to God in prayer. He says, pray the Lord's Prayer. Daily, ask that daily bread be provided for you. Daily ask to be delivered from evil. Be guided in what you do. In asking forgiveness for your own trespasses and also for the trespasses of others. We need to be guided in our life. And that's what the Lord's Prayer is seeking to do. But this calling God also says, not only be involved in prayer, I want you to be guided by holiness. Forgive our, forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. The calling God says, I want you to live in holiness. I want you to realize that walking in the Spirit means that you will be seeking always to respond to my voice that guides you through the walk, the journey of life. And then also, this rescue of God, through Jesus Christ, says to be engaged in action. In other words, we don't accept merely the goodness that God has provided through Jesus Christ. We don't simply say, I've been saved. We have to ask the question, what does this mean that through Jesus Christ we are forgiven? It means that we're called into society to present the gospel, the good news of Christ. But we are also called into action to stand up for justice, to declare God's mercy. We are called into action to care for the sick. We are called into action to provide hope for the world. So how does this translate into the what does it mean questions that we asked earlier? The world that we now live in sickness, death, violent actions, prejudice, poverty, hunger, broken relationships, and divorce. Our text says, that there is now no condemnation. Ah, oh, it's the now and the now. Now. Right now it has happened. The Christ, the cross of Christ, Jesus, is payment in full. We are no longer under bondage. We are forgiven. And that forgiveness happens right now. When my mother would say to me, David, do it right now. It never gave me the opportunity to look at one and say, hmm, when I get around to it, I'll do it. Because I knew if she saw me not accomplishing the task that she said, she would say, now, nah, David, and David would hop to it because I knew she meant it happen right now. There is no condemnation now in Christ Jesus. But that's the now right now. 
There is therefore now no condemnation. Has another meaning. There's the condemnation that talks about things that are in the process of becoming. I think of a young man who was so thrilled to find out that his grandfather shared with him that indeed, indeed, in the future, his will would say all his inheritance would go to this grandson. The man's massive wealth would be given to him in the future. And that was the future now that this young man understood. And so he waited patiently for his grandfather to die to inherit. But several years after the declaration of the grandfather, the young man received a check for $5,000. And the grandfather said in a letter, I know I promised you my inheritance in the future. But I know the struggles that you and your young family are going through right now. And right now, I think you need a little bit of that inheritance. And so I'm sending you this check. And later on, later on, you will indeed inherit all of my love. Right now, there is no condemnation. We are forgiven. And we are in the process of living out the kingdom of God. That's what the Gospels were all talking about. Right now, Jesus leads us into the kingdom of God. And so we await the promise of resurrection where there will be no sickness, no tears, no unjust behaviors. And that is the promise of the now of God. You see, forgiveness on the cross is the pain, the fulfillment of the rescue of God. But it is the resurrection that happened later that launches us into living in the kingdom of God. I go back to Luther Memorial Church, to their prayer of Pentecost, and the concluding thoughts to what does it mean? Come, Holy Spirit, move to the word as you did in the beginning, when you brought light out of darkness and ordered the chaos. Come as a fire to burn away injustice, to purify our hearts, and to melt away our divisions. Come as the wind to cleanse us of sin, to push us into action, and to waken us from our stupor. Come as the comforter to console those who mourn, to strengthen those who are afraid, and to empower those who speak for truth. Give us tongues to cry out for justice, lips to confess our sins, and mouths to call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come, Holy Spirit, move through the world, move through the church, and move through us. Come, Holy Spirit, breathe life into the dust that we created. Come, Holy Spirit, save us. Amen. Join me in prayer. Gracious God, Speak to us in our situations. Confront us with your truth. Empower us with your spirit. Call us into prayer. Call us into forgetting. Call us into action. And may your church 
represent Jesus the Christ, who provides for us no condemnation now. In the name of Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. Our hymn of the day is one of the great hymns of Isaac Watts. Isaac Watts told his father one day when he was a very young man, little boy, he said, Dad, these metered songs that we have to sing are boring. I don't like them. And his father said, okay, write something else. And he began to write. And he began to write hymns that we sing over and over again. And their message has never changed. It speaks to us today. One of those great hymns written during the time of the pandemic, sickness, and the death of the queen. He wrote these words, O oh God, our help in ages past. Join with me in singing verses 3 and 6. God of mercy, grant us wisdom. 
Loving God, you planted the seed in the valley in this valley for a congregation to preach and teach and to care for your people. And it continues that ministry that is now labeled as Central Lutheran Church. Through the years, you have called many to serve in various roles within your church. And we're grateful to you and to them. During these difficult times of building slot because of the pandemic, people isolated from worshiping together, ministry programs in limbo, we ask that you would keep us together, that you would help us to keep hope alive, that soon you will open our doors, that you will bring the people together with hearts seeking to give witness of their watchful care during these long days. God of mercy, grant us wisdom. Spirit of God, Shine your light upon us and lead us through these dark days. Enlighten also those who serve you in overseeing your congregation. We pray for our council members who are saddled with so many responsibilities. As they plan together on July 20th, begin to speak hope into their hearts and minds. Begin to help the bishop and the assistant to the bishop. Begin to lead us in the process as we seek answers to the needs of your people as Senator Luther. May the burdens they carry be lightened by the Spirit of God, revealing your plans and ministry for our church. God of mercy, grant us wisdom. Abide in God, who care for all who are in need. We ask that you would help us to remember and for those in our congregation, in our community, that need your helping hand. We pray for Terry as she grieves the death of her husband, Bob. We pray for those who are ill and needing special care. Today we remember Pastor Carolyn's mother, Mary Frances Jones, a new sickness that has come upon her, and she needs your touch. We pray for Tim's brother, Douglas Schultz, as he has suffered this week another issue, another issue that has called into question the stability of his life. Touch him, heal him according to your ministry, your mercy. We pray for Kyle Dixon, for Pastor Mike, for Reverend Charles Eagle, for Dr. Richard Dollars, for David Demarius, Jessica Moon, Gerald Ramsey, Jeff Pat Chapman, Larry Douglas, Fred Hamilton, Steve Berry, Ruth Waters, Jerry Perone. For those who are doubting, renew faith. For those who are worrying, provide release. For those who are struggling, ease burdens. For those who fear give hope. For those whom we name love, hear our prayers. God of mercy, grant us wisdom. Receive these intercessions of God and those prayers that are to be for word. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and power, and glory forever and ever. Amen. It is our tradition to include within worship an an opportunity to give back a small portion of what God has given to us. Today I remind our congregation the ways in which we can share our tithes and offerings with our church is through mailing that directly to the church or even going to the website and on the website, finding the way in which we can give through online processes. In all things, let us give back to God what God has given to us. Normally, it is our custom in worship to come to the table, to come to the table to receive substance and to remember that God provides for us each and every day. We acknowledge that there are times in our life when circumstances 
separates from receiving Holy Communion. Worshiping separately, using technology together in worship, it separates us from the physical communion that sustains us. We lack bread. We lack the wine. At such times, the church may rely upon spiritual communion through a unison prayer. So let us continue together praying. My Jesus, I believe that you are truly present in the blessed sacrament of the altar. I love you above all things and long for you in my soul. Since I cannot receive you in the sacrament of your body and blood, come spiritually into my heart. Cleanse and strengthen me with your grace, Lord Jesus, and let me never be separated from you. May I live in you, and you in me, and in this life to come. Amen. And now receive the blessing. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit the Comforter May it bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. Let us sing on our way rejoicing.